Cijenjeni čitatelji Večernjeg lista i gledatelji Večernjakove televizije, danas imamo doista specijalnog gosta, čovjeka koji u svom sportu predstavlja ono što je nekoć davno u svom predstavljao recimo Muhammed Ali, dakle čovjek koji ne samo da je veliki šampion, nego je i izrazito socijalno angažiran. Velika nam je čast imati s nama u društvu gospodina Garija Kasparova. Mr. Kasparov, welcome to Večernji TV. Thank you, thank you for having it's, me. It's a great pleasure to, to have you here. Um, I was trying to, to Google uh, who is the best chess player ever. And uh, Google says, every time Google says Gary Kasparov. All of the top 10 lists, uh, the, the answer is the same, Gary Kasparov. How do, how do you feel about that uh, 17 years after, after your uh, retirement in professional chess? Well, we... These days we rely on, on, on Google, on uh, uh, internet for any information, but I'm always very skeptical about um, comparison of the players who never met each other. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm flattered, yes, it's that people believe me the, the best player ever, but you know, maybe Magnus Carlsen disagrees and definitely there are people who think Bobby Fischer was the greatest. And um, it's it's very you know tentative because how do you know it's the it's it's like you know talking about the best uh, football players uh, who was the best Pele Maradona Messi um, and I'm sure you know you'll get different answers from people bed very much depending on their age. But I, I think you know, Magnus Carlsen. I'm curious who is who is the best football player for you? So because I think we are about the same age. So I wonder if you said Pele or Maradona. Pele. Pele. Okay, fine. I would I would go with Maradona. Yes, oh. but, it's, but still, okay. we are, but, but the younger people probably would say Messi or they'll, they'll look for you know for one of the you know just or or, yeah. or Ronaldo. Or. But even Magnus Carlsen said that you are the goat. Look, I'm. I, I'm grateful for Magnus. You know, I spent one year, you know, helping him to become as great as he is now. But, but trust me, Magnus, Magnus' performance is absolutely outstanding, and he is a great ambassador for chess. I'm so happy to see him as the as as a world champion these days. Uh, the reason for this interview is upcoming Grand Chess Tour in in Zagreb. It's a, an elite competition uh, that you started actually. How important is is that series or of events for today's chess in, in the world? Look, uh, I um, started the event with uh, with a cooperation of the St. Louis Chess Club uh, back in 2015. Yeah, after I couldn't uh, win my bid to change chess from inside uh, uh, in FIDE, uh, International Sport Federation, Chess Federation. Um, I thought, you know, it would be important to have the network of independent competitions that will not depend on on sponsorship that comes from dubious sources. Because we know Fidi has been under control of, of Russians for decades. And uh, and when you look at Fidi events, you always find these competitions taking place in very um, odd places in the countries uh, that cannot be called democratic. Um, and I thought that chess, chess uh, uh, deserved better. So we needed, you know, professional sponsorship. And, um, and that was the idea behind the event. And uh, I gradually grew And as of now, it's the it's the best chess run uh, series in the world. And at the time, where FIDE is struggling to find money because its Russian money is no longer available, and uh, many other countries that wanted to help a Russian control organization now also taking you know their hands off. So um, Grand Chess Tour uh, is demonstrates that you know we we actually you know are running something that the world of chess needed and still needs. Uh, uh, we, um, uh, in addition to our American sponsor, we got a very strong uh, sponsor in Europe now. It's the uh, Romanian best company, Superbet, that is probably the largest uh, um, betting company on the European continent, uh, uh, in, in, in European Union, except in, in that kingdom. And it's really, it's it's, it's fast growing company, uh, run by former chess player Sasha Dragic. Uh, who um, was you know, played chess in former Yugoslavia and uh, was my big chess fan. And then you know, he stopped playing because he said he recognized he would never be Gary Gaspar. And he just, and uh, as of now, uh, Superbet uh, supporting events, of course, in, in Bucharest, in, in Zagreb, and in Warsaw. And we also looking for some few other opportunities next year, so which means that 
uh, in the, the we can add tournaments depending on the calendar because we just it is so much interest actually to become part of independent series that is run professionally and and very uh, transparent. There's no no more opaque sponsorship. And I think that's that's what will help chess to to gain more reputation among among uh, our commercial sponsors. Will you play this year like you did last year? Yeah, that's the yeah. You're asking too much. So I, uh, <laughs> even last year was a very bad experience because and this year it's impossible because I'm I'm so much involved with political issues now. After war in Ukraine, my mind is just traveling elsewhere. Uh, I, I, I can play Fisher's chess, 960 chess, when this was no opening theory. But playing, you know, events where you have to do so much work, you know, as these guys do, it's it's really, you know, it's too painful. And uh, I don't mind losing, but I just don't want to look like an idiot. Will you play uh, Simultanka like uh, this, this yeah. time like you did? In- I, I do all the exhibitions, you know, where again I, I, I can do... I can do relatively well. Actually, I will play 960 in St. Louis because, again, as I said, it's not about opening theory. And it's just I, I know how to move the pieces. And I, I can do much better if I don't have to do some special homework. But facing these guys, you know, uh, with, with no preparation, because basically what I know about chess is too old. And, uh, and uh, I'm trying to avoid opening, de- uh, opening debates. And just, you know, it doesn't fit my style. So I probably could do better than, 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 than I did last year, but I don't know. I, I, I'm afraid my energy level now is not, is not there. Can you tell me what is the largest number of opponents that you ever played in, in chess uh, simultaneously? Look, you know, it's, the, it's always nice to actually to boast the numbers. Oh, I played 40 or 50 or... And I think that's probably the word couple of times the number ex- exceeded 50, but it was a long, long, long time ago. Now, typically the number, when I was younger, you know, I would say it was 35, 40 boards. Now I try to, 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 to um, uh, limit it to, 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 to 20, uh, uh, just, you know, because again, I'm just, I'm, I'm not of the same age. But it's important to understand that it's, it's also, it's about the strengths of the players. You can see uh, uh, an exhibition with 40 players, but very weak, you know, like, you know, just total amateurs. Uh, and you can also see an event with 10 players, 15 players, but all of them club players. So that's why it's not just about quali- quantity, it's also about the quality of the players. Yeah, you have played si- uh, simultaneous games against many, many celebrities, politicians, actors, uh, athletes. Has anyone surprised you? Uh, with with uh, their chess knowledge. No, look, uh, they play of you know typical chess as the as uh, relative relative amateurs. Uh, uh, but I guess it's, it's uh, speaking about you know events in Croatia. So I think it's in '95. I played an event in Split, and uh, Goran Ivanovic was uh, was yeah. playing, and uh, and he did it much better than I expected. Actually, it's. People thought I, I, I drew the game because, you know, I wanted to do a favor. No, actually, it was just a real, a real uh, um, good game. Sometimes it happens. So that's the, that's the, that's the best I can remember. I know that uh, you are interested in, in chess for fri- primary school. Uh, how significant chess could be for mental development of the children? Oh, it's it's a great extra uh, mm, mm, subject for early for early years because it's very inexpensive. I mean, you don't have to build a, a, a stadium or a swimming pool or tennis court, and also it, it has a connection to computers to to the modern technology. But uh, on top of that, it helps to develop kids' uh, cognitive skills uh, because it teaches them, you know. Um, um, uh, big picture, so how to understand the effect of, of things happening on one side of the board uh, to another side of the board, and also it it, it it's you know helps to create connections. So we, we had so many examples how how even small portion of chess teaching could uh, help kids to to develop better skills in math and reading. Uh, can we talk about your childhood and how uh, how important uh, uh, chess was for? For you, and uh, what was your uh, first encounter with, with chess, actually? Look, uh, yeah, for me, chess was not, you know, uh, educational game because I, from the very beginning I was very competitive. I was uh, uh, very lucky to actually find the game 
watching my parents trying to solve a puzzle from a local newspaper in Baku, uh, and uh, um, and I I was immediately fascinated with the game, and uh, it ever since you know I was five and a half or six at the time. Ever since you know I have chess as the as the my um, fa- my devoted companion. So now I'm just you know I'm nearly sixty and I'm still you know um, um, having great great joy by by looking at the game of chess, uh, even just moving the pieces, playing and solving puzzles or or teaching other uh, other young stars. Growing in in, in uh, growing up in in the Soviet Soviet Union, uh, did you ever dream as a youngster about what life was like behind the Iron Curtain as a kid? Well, uh, I grew up in the in the uh, uh, late sixties or the seventies, actually in the seventies, yeah. Um, and I, um, I, I mean, I knew just something, you know, from from the books and from the movies because it was not, you know, that you know uh, uh, that tight as during Stalin's years. But also, I had, I had a chance to experience it because at age thirteen, I traveled to France uh, to represent Soviet Union uh, in the World Under Sixteen Championship. And and the next year I had another another try, so but also in France, seventy six and seventy seven, and uh, uh, that was a huge impression on me. So I uh, I quickly realized that you know the life in the Soviet Union was far from being perfect, and um, and uh, I uh, thanks to my home education, so I knew about shortcomings of communism, and I always you know wanted to um, to um, change you know my country just to become, you know, more like uh, uh, other countries in the free world rather than being a communist dictatorship. Uh, your father was Jewish and your mother is uh, Armenian. Uh, if uh, Wikipedia uh, is to be believed, uh, you changed your last name from Weinstein uh, to, to Kasparov at the age of 12. What was the reason? Yeah, this is the, this is the case when Wikipedia is right. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I, my father died when I was seven, so which was a big tragic, you know, loss in our family. And my mother never remarried, and she spent uh, the remaining fifty years of her life working for her son. So that was, you know, just this whole, you know, devotion of her life. And uh, and uh, uh, it was very natural back in the Soviet Union, just you know, to um, uh, because I grew up with my 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 mother and her parents. Uh, it, that's to to uh, to um, adopt the name of your mother. Especially, yeah, because uh, uh, her her father, my grandfather, had three daughters. I know that didn't have a son, but of course, the another reason was that the the anti-Semitism in the Soviet Union was uh, was an, another obstacle, and um, naturally, having an Armenian name was slightly better. Though I grew up in Azerbaijan, which was also you know quite a, a disadvantage. Uh, but as I say, well, overall, you know, it's it's it was a family decision based on the fact that I was with my mother, I grew up with my mother in her family, and. Uh, and my um, my uh, relatives from the father's side, namely his younger brother, they understood that it's it was better for me for many reasons. Uh, I read somewhere that you describe yourself as a self-appointed Christian. Uh, what would you that mean actually? Well, okay, you know, I believe in Christian values. I I I. I, I have you know a great comfort you know reading Bible, uh, but you know, I don't I don't belong to any church. Actually, I don't believe that there should be any mediator between between us and uh, 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 our private affairs and supreme being. Um, so that's that's why you know while I I'm uh, believe that I'm a product of the uh, Judeo Christian civilization and I you know I fully embrace the values of Christianity. I I don't think that myself you know as the fully full Christian because I, I, I was not baptized again I don't see any reason of of anybody to to mediate between me and and, and supreme being. Let's talk a little bit about uh, Russian chess. Uh, uh, on one of the top ten lists, uh, six of uh, ten best ever players are Russians. Uh, what is so special about uh, Russia and, and chess? I think we're here going into a serious linguistic misunderstanding. You're talking about Russian or Soviet? A Soviet, yeah, yeah, yeah. you are right. It's you a are huge right. misunderstanding because, yeah. look, the Soviet Union dominated chess, but you had Petrosian, who was an Armenian, 
Paul Keris, who was uh, um, uh, Estonian, Mikhail Tal, who grew up in Riga, Jew from Riga. You had uh, players like Ifim Geller and uh, 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 another, another great Jewish player from Odessa, so from 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 yeah. Ukraine. So when you again, I don't know what's the what's the top list now, but it's just it's the it's uh, it was a Soviet Union, so that's why using the word Russian, it's the it's incorrect in two means, uh, meanings. One is as of nationality, most of them probably were Jews, like Batvinik, for instance. So, uh, and the, many of them were not born inside proper Russia today. So that's the that's 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 why when people talk about Soviet chess, you know, they should not mix it with Russia today again because Russian Federation was the biggest republic in 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 the Soviet Union. But many but many players like myself, I was born and raised in Baku in Azerbaijan yeah. in the deep south. So. Um, uh, uh, chess in the Soviet Union was a state-supported enterprise because it was part of ideology. And uh, I shouldn't tell you, you know, you grew up in, in, in Yugoslavia. So chess was big here. So it's, uh, it was really a very popular game. And, uh, and now when you look at the, at, at the countries that, that appeared, you know, in the territory of former Yugoslavia, so you don't see any, any, any real chess left. So it's uh, it was somehow a result of the of the propaganda, and um, and uh, uh, I probably I'm the last person to complain about benefits receiving from the state support for the game because I uh, grew I grew up very quickly because I had access to this chess infrastructure that was built in the Soviet Union, and as as of now Russia is still a Russia proper it's still fine but it's no longer dominant force uh, in the world. Um, and um, I'm glad to see that more and more chess is moving to the free world. Um, uh, though we still have now chess powerhouses like China, less less of China now, actually more of India, which is interesting. So it's a it's a democratic India is actually now overshadowing China by by um, chess development. Well, uh, can we say that in, in back in Soviet Union that chess players are, were a matter of prestige? Uh, for for Soviet Union, uh, uh, like cosmo cosmonauts or famous writers like Tolstoy, Dostoevsky, or or poets like Pushkin, uh, was that important like that? To, well, for, for the it, image it, of, of Soviet it, Union it, it, abroad, mentioned they died before Soviet Union, yeah. so that's yeah, they, they they were household names. Yeah. yeah, of course, chess players, you know, uh, top chess players, they were big stars really big stars. It's more like, you know, basketball tennis players uh, yeah. in, in America or in Yugoslavia, though former Yugoslavia, though again, even here in the former Yugoslavia, you had, you know, players like Gligoric and Ivko van der Bojevic, so being big, big, big household names. Um, um, I, yeah, I, I, yeah, I think that the world champion in the Soviet Union was kind of the high priest of, of, yeah. of, 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 of a big temple, in a big temple. So it's almost sacred, yeah, no doubt. But uh, it's it's also probably not surprising because there are so few world chess champions. So in history, so as of now we have only sixteen. So it's this is the the world champion starting from eighteen eighty six, which again makes chess a unique sport with this unbroken tradition that goes all the way back to the nineteenth century. And and for all these years we had only sixteen players who won the title. Uh, at the moment. Probably uh, chess is the best uh, sport to play online. Do you play chess online? Yeah, of course, yes. That's, that's, that's goes without saying. So, uh, where, uh, where else I can actually, I can move the pieces. I always prefer word move, move the pieces because playing is a little bit too, too um, professional sounds to me. But uh, yeah, thank you very much for calling chess a sport. I think it's very important that we recognize that chess is a sport. When people say, oh, it doesn't have very much physical activity, my answer is okay. What about golf? What about curling? So, by the way, so this is yeah, uh, yeah. It's it's about it's 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 a game that you know requires so much energy, so much preparation. So how what else? You know, it's uh, and you can see that it's getting younger and younger because the pressure on players, you know, is huge. They have to memorize tons of information. They have to spend hours in front of the computers, then playing it. And it's it has it has a toll on your body. So people don't recognize how much energy is physical energy is being spent during just one game. And of course, it's a typically a chess tournament is a long one. It takes uh, days, uh, uh, sometimes you know even weeks 
yeah, if you talk about the World Championship match, and it has a huge, huge uh, impact on 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 your know, physical condition. So that's why, again, I'm happy that chess has been called sport here, and uh, um, and of course, you know, on the internet, it's it's gaining popularity uh, 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 every day now. We, as we speak, there are hundreds of thousands of games being played on online. Yeah. And that's, that's also a great demonstration how this ancient game, the game that is, I don't know, 1,500 or more years old, uh, keeps adjusting to, to the demand of the society. So uh, people often ask me, so why chess is not today as popular and when Fischer plays Pasky or when you, Gary, played Karpov? which is an optical mistake, because chess in 1972 or in 1985 was much, much, much smaller than today, but there was nothing else. So this is, we, we didn't have the same kind of entertainment industry online. So compared to days I played Carp of Chess grew, grew, grew up a thousand times, but the world of entertainment grew one million times. So that's why while chess universe is much bigger, you don't see it you know, in the constellation of so many entertainment activities. Uh, you have played chess against a computer called uh, uh, Big Blue, uh, and 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 uh, what was that experience like? Like uh, playing uh, against against someone who do who doesn't show emotions. I, I played chess against many computers, but it's just it's, it, I think it was an important part of experiment to actually to understand so how how it will work, you know, for us and machines and. Uh, I'm very happy now that I was part of this experiment. And as I said, I played many matches before and after the blue. Um, and uh, look, it's, uh, it's not, it, it doesn't make much sense these days because machines are so much better in chess or in Go or in any other game. So whether it's the computer game or Texas Hold'em poker or so, as long as you have a, a fixed rules and fixed you know, framework, machines will always dominate because they, they, they know the numbers and they make few mistakes. They cannot calculate the game to the end, but it doesn't. They, they don't have to. It's all about making few mistakes. So you may say, if you want to use human terms, having very steady hand. So while humans, even the best of us, we we still, you know, uh, are make mistakes and sometimes very serious mistakes. And uh, um, and I, yeah, I, I I don't want to spend too much time talking about this experiment experience. But look. Uh, it's about the game of chess, so you just you just have to recognize that your opponent has very different uh, different qualities. But as I say, it's no longer interesting because machines are so much better. And now our relations is not about fighting machines, but working with machines. To coll it's collaborating, and uh, every chess player now works with computers to prepare for openings. But not only chess, everywhere. So in in finance, in medicine, you name it. Uh, machines become fundamentally important for for improving the quality of our decisions. Let me ask you a little bit uh, strange question. Can you imagine chess tournament with humans and robots playing each against uh, against each other? No, like I said it's, there's no there's no need now just to have a tournament. Uh, machines are way 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 better. I mean, it's they can be if you can download the chess engine on your laptop today. Uh, so it will be so much better than Magnus Carlsen. Uh, so it's a gap between this kind of device. Again, on your laptop, so this is the, the machine uh, that, that just, you know, doesn't need a special, you know, hardware power. Uh, the difference is like, you know, between Usain Bolt and Ferrari. You can run the first 50 meters on par, but then it's just, it's say goodbye. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, you ended your playing uh, career, professional career, at the age of 42. Uh, yeah, is it too still 41? 41, yeah. Was, is it too what? early for chess retirement? Is it too early for chess retirement? Look, it's not about age. It's about whether you feel that you have to go elsewhere. So I always wanted to make a difference, and I did a lot in the world of chess. But I just reached the point where I thought, okay, time for me to move elsewhere to build my life because you can play chess forever. So I, I had very various interests and I thought it was a really good moment for me to look for other, uh, other activities, especially because I saw that my country, Russia, was sliding into another dictatorship. And I thought that, you know, I, I had my, my duty to uh, fight, fight it back. So not that, you know, I expected me to win, 
It was no, it was not the same battle as in chess. Uh, it's cause it's it's some kind of moral duty that I thought I had to take, but also I um, looked for every uh, for other opportunities like you know doing speeches, writing books, and uh, and uh, trying to um, invest my chess experience and my analytical skills in other uh, in other areas that could be beneficial for humanity. And uh, I'm very proud that since 2005, you know, I started a new life. Actually, I just married to. Uh, and uh, my wife was very, very help, helpful to build the life that is not totally dependent on, on previous chess glory. Yes, people still say, Gary, you're a great chess player. But I, I wrote several books on decision making, on computers, on politics. I uh, have been actively involved in fighting for human rights, not only in Russia, but elsewhere. Um, and uh, um, I'm now doing things in cybersecurity. So it's just, it's again, it's a various interest. Well, chess still, you know, is a part of my life. I, I'm, I have a sport chess foundation. I'm working with young stars, but it's no longer the core of my my life. And um, and I think it's it was a really good decision that I st- stopped playing chess, still being number one, but, but yet, you know, um, having enough time and energy to build my reputation elsewhere what what period of life is uh, in terms of uh, uh, brain strength uh, better the, the best one for 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 chess well they used to say when i grew up that you know it's the peak probably is it's 30 to 35 years old i um, i don't know i I think now when we look at the average age of chess players, so probably it's 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 they you know it's probably now less, maybe 25, 30. Though Magnus Carlsen is still doing great, and he's what he's 30, he'll be 32 this year. Yeah. Um, I, I still think you know that's the it's the around 30s. This is probably you reach the peak, as because it's it's not about you know you cannot measure just you know this peak exactly. It's 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 a it's a combination when you still have you know your energy and you have enough experience. So how to bring them together? I have plenty of experience now. I can explain you why this move was good or bad. I mean, I just it's the unless I'm pressed by time and 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 uh, tournament uh, uh, um, uh, uh, anxiety, I can do. I mean, I, I can be good at analysis. So I'm. But I don't have the same energy to play. I don't have the same level of concentration. So I think 30 plus, that's, the, that's an ideal moment where you have energy, concentration, and, and you really you know, have a lot of experience to, to merge. How tough were your physical preparations for those big matches you, 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 you had? I remember you, com- you were coming to, to Rovine to prepare yourself for some of the matches. Yeah? Look, uh, it's my actually 30th summer in Croatia. So my first time was in Trinidad in 1993. So as the so every summer since 1993, you know, I'm in Croatia. So first years I was in Trinidad, and then I moved to Makarska for another I think six or seven seasons, and now I'm in Potstrana now. Now as a, as 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 a Croatian citizen, you know, with my Hrvatska uh, Potomica. So I'm, I I uh, I live here every summer. Actually, we spent here even ten months during the pandemics. Basically, you know, just hiding here, yeah, yeah. and kids, kids did school, you know, in New York because they were born in New York uh, online. Um, I, uh, thanks to my lead mother, so I was very uh, um, concentrated on physical preparation from early days. So as this, and that's helped me to stay on top for so long. And in Croatia, I just remember just this every summer we had very strong physical, you know, just uh, exercises and uh, um, uh, rowing. You know, in 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 Makar Sky was always rowing. So, uh, and of course, swimming here. Um, and, um, and that's why I could, I could sustain the pressure of long tournaments. I, could, I, I never got tired as my younger opponents because I was really, really strong. And I, I believe that physical preparation was a very important part, integrated part of your uh, overall success. As a famous person, you could choose any of the countries to live to, to, for your second home. But you, you, you have chosen uh, Croatia, why? Look, it's this. Sometimes you know, it's you, you, you have this kind of luck, you know, and uh, and then things you know work, you know, uh, in your favor. Um, I uh, my uh, first trip to Croatia was, I, yeah, it was in 1993, and and it's happened after I supported uh, Croatia 
uh, in, in its conflict uh, um, uh, against uh, Serbia. And just I, I was one of the first individuals who raised the voice uh, uh, um, condemning Serbian aggression and, and offering my, my, my help. Um, so, and, uh, um, and I also, you know, I really like Croatia because, I mean, let's not forget, I grew up in, 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 in the south of the Soviet Union. So, um, here in Potstrana, as of in Makarska, so uh, I felt home very much because the climate is about the same. Mm -hmm. So, it's the, uh, the sea, it's basically, it's, I grew up in a place where we had a sea, we had sun, and we had wines. Yeah, so this is the, 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 the vineyards. So, that's, 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 that's the right place for me to live. And and I built you know, very strong ties with many uh, uh, with uh, with uh, 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 many of uh, my friends in Croatia, and uh, uh, when you know when the moment came for me to leave Russia because I faced imminent arrest, so I asked Croatian government for help, and um, I have to uh, I have to say that uh, then Prime Minister Milanovic was very very um, helpful by uh, immediately offering me uh, the passport, which again was, was a great relief. And I feel very much at home here. And, uh, and my wife also received the passport, so uh, uh, um, my little son, so born in New York. So we, we know Croatia is our second home and uh, we are very happy in that we know where to go. And as I said, the pandemics, that's a moment where you, know, you test you know, your affiliations. And we spent 10 months here from June 2020 to April 2021 in Potstrana, and uh, it feels like really feels like home. Do you enjoy some some uh, particular Croatian food or, or music? What, oh, do you, what do you like the most about about Croatia? It's full, yeah, look, there's fish here, so phenomenal fish. But it's also you know it's the I, I like the the cuisine based based on on mostly based on on olive oil and. Uh, Again, as for wines and olive oil, you know, definitely, you know, you can debate which region does the best. So I think the best olive oil for me comes from Istria. So I don't want to have to, uh, but the wine is, the Dalmatian wine is great. Yeah, so, um, and uh, um, again, it's it's a healthy food. I mean, what do you need these days? You know, I, I get tons of fancy food in France or elsewhere, but here in Croatia, it's a, it's really healthy food and a healthy atmosphere. So, and and again, I just, I like people and I just, I can, I feel that the whole atmosphere makes me feel stronger. Do you like uh, to listen any of Croatian music? Yeah, well, just again, music is fine. But again, I'm not, I'm not really, I, I, I'm traditionally, I, I just, I attach to classical music. So I just, I don't have any, any, any special preferences. So, but, you know, sound, is, sound of music always makes me feel, you know, uh, motivated. As you have just mentioned, you played for exiled Vukovar and your biggest uh, rival uh, was uh, Karpo. Uh, he was in occupied uh, uh, Vukovar yeah. from other side. Right. Yeah. Have you ever have you ever discussed that with, with, with him? What can we discuss? Karpo is a member of Putin's parliament. He was always on that side. So it's the we were on the opposite sides during Soviet years. We were on the opposite sides during the Balkan Wars. And we are on the opposite side now. So he is the one of the members of the parliament who voted for this criminal war in Ukraine. So um, what can we discuss? And um, and I, I was always on the side of those who were victims of the aggression. So I I don't see that this is anything to be discussed. I'm nearly 60, he is now over 70, so we are not going to change. So he belongs to one world, which is a world of aggression and, and, and totalitarianism, and I belong to the opposite side. So that's that's how it is. Uh, back in eighties, can we say that uh, you were at the the symbol of coming perestroika, and Karpo was symbol of those who fear perestroika? You don't have to say that. That was a fact. That, so it was yeah. the, it's uh, for many people in the Soviet Union, my victory in nine eighty five was a, was a sign that change was possible. So when half Armenian, half Jewish boy from Baku beat a Russian champion in Moscow. That's, you know, that was a signal that maybe the whole system can change one day. When was the last time you, you were in, in Russia? Uh, it's I, it's uh, end of February 2013. It's nine and a half years ago. So I left Russia uh, for, for, for a foreign trip. And then I got a call from my mother saying that I got a quote unquote invitation to visit the Russian police, actually the special investigative units that's that working on political protest. So, and I knew that would be 
that will be arrest. So if I come back, so and um, I, I, I stayed, I stayed abroad, and um, and that's it. So it's um, it will be ten years next February. But you know, looking at what's happening now in in, in Ukraine, this is this tragic war and and uh, and new crimes committed by Putin regime. I believe that you know I may return to Russia sooner than many people think. Have you been detained as a, as a, a, an activist for human rights and and and, and democracy? Back oh, yeah, in- I've detained a few times. Once I even spent uh, f- uh, five days in jail. So uh, I was beaten. So which is again, it's by today's standard, it was almost vegetarian. You know, because today people go in jail for five years for protesting against Putin regime. But I was one of the pioneers. So in this in this in this field, uh, and I think mean, it was. Kind of, you know, um, regimes test whether they could uh, uh, imprison a great star, because you know, as I said, you know, if I was subject for this treatment, what about the rest of us? So and uh, and uh, yeah, I'm 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 not, you know, I'm not surprised what's happened to me because people march with me peacefully on the streets of Russia. They are in in an exile like me now, or in jail like Alexei Navalny, or even killed like Boris Dems. Uh, you just said that you have been beaten in, in prison. Have you been seriously uh, beaten? Or? Street, actually, that's, that's, that's I don't know, not the prison, in, on the street. On the street. Was, you have been beaten on the street, yeah? It was, yeah, it's uh, well, just, you know, the 12 years. When I tried to actually you know, get out, so they just, you know, I mean, it was not that bad, but, but still very unpleasant. As I understand, Putin put you on the list of enemies of, of, the, of Russian state. That must not be a, a pleasant feeling at, at the moment. So what can I do? So what's it? Yeah. How, how do you, how do you feel about that? I mean, uh, 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 do you feel like uh, like a kind of, of target? Mm, yeah, probably. I don't know, but you know, it's, I'm trying to be practical. So would it help if I worry every day about it? No, it yeah, just no. I live my life. I mean, I don't go to some countries where I believe you know that the, the the KGB still has you know just it's the free hand to operate. I wouldn't go to Turkey, for instance. I wouldn't even go to Hungary. So just uh, because Orban is a big friend of Putin, and uh, and I don't know whether you know Hungarian police would be you know looking you know uh, 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 the other side if I'm being you know kidnapped, for instance. So, um, but otherwise, you know, I, I I try to keep my life you know as as it is. So um, uh, it's you know understanding you know what Putin can do to you. It just it's it doesn't make me feel happy. But so I'm not going to change. My life. I don't want to change my, my views on Putin's dictatorship, uh, and I'm yeah. I will continue what I've been doing, uh, no matter what. Have you ever been in fear for your life? Uh, look. Any particular moment? Yeah. No, not not. I know there's a risk, but I just again, I'm trying to brush off this this thought. So again, it doesn't help if you if you're being paralyzed by fear. Again, I, I tell you know people when ask me about fear. So are you fearless? I said no. Nobody's fearless. If somebody tells you I'm fearless, I wouldn't trust this person. It's about our ability to manage our fear. So I I can keep it under control. But I believe you are too famous to let's say to 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 kill you or something. That that would be. It's the I don't, you know, let's let, let let's not go that far. I mean this is the. Yeah. And Putin committed so many crimes. I mean, come on, this is this is every day we watch the crimes in Ukraine. They kill civilians. They it's indiscriminate shelling. So there's uh, tens of thousands innocent people have been killed, and and Putin is behind it. He doesn't give a damn about spilling more blood. So that's 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 why I don't think there are any limits for his crimes. Uh, uh, but again, so what can I do? I just have to continue doing what I believe is right. Can you give us? Um uh, a little bit of Putin profile from your perspective, f- from your point of view. Look, I, Putin is a dictator. He is a, it's a fascist dictatorship, and uh, I don't think we need we need to waste too much time, you know, looking into his psychology. So we read history books about other dictators of the past, and uh, and um, I knew that he would uh, go as far as as we allow him, and unfortunately, the free world didn't want to hear the warnings didn't want to see the, the warning signs. And, and what is happening now in Ukraine is, is a result of 
many, many years of appeasement, many, many years of disbelief that Putin was capable of, of the worst crimes since World War II. What must happen without it being a, a bio, biological end for Putin to leave the power? Putin doesn't leave power as, it, as every dictator, dictator before him. He can be removed uh, as a result of the uh, events that will cripple his regime. Um, and uh, the only way it happens, it's the um, it's Ukrainian victory. It's a decisive Ukrainian victory in the war, uh, combined with sanctions that will will um, destroy Russian economy, and 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 massive pu public revolt uh, uh, as a result of these two. Uh, that's the only condition. And then then his own inner circle will take care of him, as it happened, you know, before with with other dictators. Expecting Putin to 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 walk away or or retire or even you know just die now soon because we are rumors about his health, I don't want to waste time on that. So I think that everybody wants you know um, um, uh, good for Russia and for the world. You know must help Ukraine now these days because I used to say that the liberation of Russia from Putin's fascism will begin with liberation of Crimea and return of this territory to Ukraine. You are the one who, who predicted uh, this uh, Russian yeah. aggression to, to, to Ukraine uh, many years ago. How, how, did you, how did you know, actually, that it will happen? I just listened to Putin. Yeah. I just listened to what he said. I followed Russian propaganda. And Vladimir Putin, you know, as many dictators before him, who always lied about what he'd done, but he was very honest about what he wanted to accomplish. Putin kept talking about the collapse of the Soviet Union being the greatest geopolitical catastrophe of the 20th century. Quote, unquote, he talked about no former KGB agents, meaning that, you know, he always, you know, remained KGB. And, you know, he never considered Ukraine as a real state. And uh, you look at his record, starting with his war in Grozny, in, in Chechnya, carpet bombing Grozny, killing political opponents, uh, um, helping Bashar al-Assad in Syria, you know, the bombing Syrian cities, and annexing Crimea. Annexation of Crimea was the first step. That's what I said. It is the beginning of total destruction of Ukraine. He will be preparing for final blow, and uh, he has been waiting for Nord Stream 2, the pipeline, to be built, uh, then the attack. Again, I didn't have to look at the crystal ball. I just had to listen to what Putin said, to what his propaganda said, and I believe that they would carry the plan because Putin believed that he was invincible and the free world did absolutely nothing to, to, to help Ukraine and stop Putin. Now, four and a half months of the war and U European Union already had six packages of sanctions. Americans had sanctions. The Brits had sanctions. What about eight years? For eight years, they could impose some sanctions on Putin to send a signal that the further aggression could actually have a price. No. They did, they did nothing, and for Putin it was an encouragement. Some international media saying that he is ill at the moment. Uh, some people say that he's mental, that it has mental illness. Uh, some others they say that it's physical Ill, illness. I don't care. I don't know. Those those are the rumors, and I you know I'm I'm a professional player. I used to analyze facts. How do we know the 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 health of a dictator is always the biggest secret of the totalitarian state. Yeah. So why should we waste our time? Maybe he's, he's terminally ill. I mean, thanks God. Maybe he'll die tomorrow. I don't know. Yeah. What I know is that Ukraine needs help. Ukraine needs weapons. Ukraine needs humanitarian s s supplies. And the only way for us to see the collapse of Putin regime, a real way, is for Ukraine to win the war. Uh, is that true that many of Putin's associates, like Peskov or Shoigu, uh, are involved in, 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 in the work of Russian Chess Federation, actually? Well, it's not true. It's, this is, it's, it's on the website of Russian Chess Federation. Yeah. You look at the website of Russian Chess Federation, you find out that they have you know, more powerful people than Russian Security Council. So Peskov, I think, it's, I think he's the uh, chairman of the Board of Trustees. You have Shoigu, I think you have Mayor of Moscow, Sabanin, you have a few ministers, you have some oligarchs. This is, you know, that's, uh, that's not surprising because Chess was, you know, uh, was after the collapse of the Soviet Union, was a very important tool to spread, you know, the KGB influence. 
And we had Kirsan Ilubjirov as the president of federation for more than 20 years. Now we have Arkady Dvorkovic, another, you know, uh, Russian bureaucrat. So uh, it's, it's, a, it's a demonstration how important the game is. And that's why many big corporations like Gazprom, Nor Norilsky Nickel, uh, uh, Foss Agro, they have been, you know, quote unquote, asked to, to, to support chess. And that's why, going back to the beginning of our conversation about Grand Chess Tour, that's why chess now is facing a crisis. Because it, the, the official chess structure in the world used to rely on this money, either Russian money or money coming from another despotic regimes that were close to Russia. So, and, and now they are in crisis because they have to follow the sanctions. They cannot accept Russian money. So we'll, I'm curious to see who is going to pay for match uh, uh, Magnus Cross in Yanni Pomnish, the next World Championship match. Fide President Arkady Dvorkovic, uh, who was very close to former Prime Minister Medvedev, publicly condemned the war in, in Ukraine. Do you know uh, what happened next to him after that? Look, uh, his condemnation is, was very, very uh, call it flexible. Yeah, yes, he, but you know, saying I'm against the war actually means nothing. You know, I believe that, you know, there's a test for any Russian citizen. I'm working with a Russian uh, action committee with people like Mikhail Khodorkovsky and other, you know, prominent uh, 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 immigrants. And we think that the test is simple. You should say war is criminal, regime is illegitimate, Ukraine is a whole. So recognizing the full, you know, sovereignty and territorial integrity of Ukraine. Unless you say these three things in one sentence without choking. The rest is just doesn't mean anything. Yeah, you are right. Yeah. Which is trying to sit on two chairs, but from what I know, and again, I don't pretend to have this previous information, he actually left Russia. He's not even there. So he has been traveling around the world for the last few months. So since, uh, I don't know, since March or April. Uh, but you should probably ask Fide about his whereabouts. Again, I don't care because I still think that, you know, Fide is an organization that follows orders received from Moscow. Like some other famous Russian uh, athletes, you could have been loyal to, to Putin and enjoy privileges, but you chose resistance to, to his role. Uh, what made you to do that, actually? From early, early age, actually. Going back, you know, you, we talked about it. So yeah. I, I belong to the other side. I believe in, in, in human dignity, in human rights, in democracy, and I always wanted my country to be a free one. It is not now, but I'm not going to change. And I. I thought it was a very natural choice, so to to you know to follow your conscience. Uh, I grew up, you know, uh, admiring Soviet dissidents, you know, who had a motto: "So do what you must, and so be it." And my mother, on, on the top of my bed when I was a teenager, was 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 a poster saying, "If not you, who else?" I I do what I believe is right, and um, look, um, I. Uh, it's speaking about other players, you know, so I, I mentioned briefly that I tried in 2014 to change FIDE, I ran for FIDE president, and it was a total disaster. It's not just because, uh, you know, uh, Russia could control, you know, some small countries or just third world countries. Many European nations voted against me. I mean, you're talking about democracy after Crimea, after Crimea. You still had countries like Germany, France, Spain, Switzerland voting for Putin's candidate. Malaysia, after MH17, still voted for Putin. So you could see how deep is Putin's corruption and how, mm -hmm. and by the way, now we discover, so how many Western politicians are just, it's the, they are somehow, you know, uh, finding ways of supporting Putin or at least, you know, trying to bring down the criticism. Uh, I think we need, we, go, we have to go through this period of revaluation. Re and uh, the, it's tragic that Ukraine is paying the highest price in blood. The Ukrainian blood, blood of innocent people is washing away our sins. But we actually see who is who now. And that's the, for me, that's the, that's the turning point. Anybody who is not blaming Putin for his crimes is on the wrong side. Uh, on the other hand, former world champion Kramnik openly supported uh, the aggression against Ukraine. So Fide expelled him. No, 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 no. It's the... Karyakin, I think. Karyakin, yeah, 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 you're right, you're right. right. That's his for challenger. Yeah, yeah. It's an expelled, you know, they just, you know, they had to follow the process, but he's still playing in tournaments in Russia. 
Kramnik, by the way, Kramnik is silent. Kramnik is this. The, um, there were many Russian players, including, for instance, Yanni Pomnich, who signed a letter against the war early days. Again, the letter was a bit weak, but at least, you know, it was a protest. So, and uh, there were, I think there were 44 Russian grandmasters who signed it, and I applaud them, because many of them still live in Russia. But uh, majority is still sitting on the fence, and some of them are Sergei Karyakin. They are just, you know, even came up with full support, which I believe, you know, it makes, makes him an accomplice of these crimes. Uh, you are Russian, uh, but you, you are against uh, the perf performance of Russian athletes at the international competitions. It seems to me uh, that you also had a, I believe, public discussion about that with, with Novak Djokovic. Look, it was indirect because I, I, I spoke, uh, I actually responded to his, uh, his uh, comments uh, uh, on my Twitter. Look, I have to clarify my position that is that you know, I'm not against, you know, total ban. What I believe is to be done, I think it's the right approach, is to ask them to sign the declaration I mentioned. They have to recognize that the war is criminal, the regime is illegitimate, the fascist dictatorship of Vladimir Putin, and Ukrainian territorial integrity is fully recognized. If they sign this paper, they can play. If they don't, they should not. So I think everybody deserves a chance. So you should be given a choice. So either you support Putin or you condemn the, uh, condemn the war in the strongest terms and you support Ukraine. So I think that simply you know, saying yes or no based on passport is not correct. Um, now, as for Novak Djokovic, so I think that his comments were, and many, by the way, other top tennis players, they were uh, totally, you know, um, mm, mm, misplaced because he talked about, you know, invitations by, by uh, ratings, not nationality. And my response was, in Ukraine, they kill by nationality, not by ratings. So I think it's a it's what we see in this case and in many other cases, like, you know, some top players in NHL, so that like Russian, a uh, uh, great Russian uh, uh, ice hockey player Ovechkin. He's a captain of, of, of Washington, our team, a team in Washington, D.C. Um, uh, they, you know, it's, it's some, um, I think some sort of the um, social, um, um, uh, dumbness. So they just, yeah. you know, they just do not, yeah. you know, understand we, that we're dealing with, with, with crimes that Europe has not seen since World War II. Yeah. I don't want to undermine the crimes committed in Balkan Wars, but we do understand Balkan War was much, I mean, the size was not nothing compared to, to, to what's happening in Ukraine now. So it still was very tragic. And, and of course, you know, the Serbian aggression, you know, deserved to be condemned, you know, in, in, in worst terms. But still, you know, we are seeing now the one of the strongest armies in the world. I mean, using the firepower that was not seen since World War II. Not a single war, even when you're talking about Korea or Vietnam, not, nothing comes close, or Iraq war or Afghanistan. Ukraine you know, uh, 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 received you know, a treatment of 3,000 Russian missiles. 3,000 missiles have been fired to Ukraine, not counting bombs from the planes and shells. So it's, one third of the country has been destroyed. You know, nearly 120,000 buildings have been ruined in Ukraine. So uh, not understanding that this is, the, this is the crime that must be condemned in strongest terms, I think it's, a, it's really bad news for, 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 for even for great athletes who are showing such, in my view, such civic irresponsibility. In your opinion, how long should last this ban for Russian athletes who doesn't want to, to recognize that, that this is aggression? And uh, uh, da, does it, as long as as the war uh, lasts, or maybe even, even even longer? Definitely as long as the war goes on. But as for the end of the war, it's another story. I don't think we have much time to debate it. So mm -hmm. I think the world, you know, should keep sanctions on Russia. And uh, and I would still keep it, you know, as this, as long as Russia fully clears Ukraine, and Ukraine restores its territorial integrity, until reparations being paid, because you're talking about hundreds of billions of dollars now of damage until war criminals being brought to justice. I don't think that before it happens, the world should lead sanctions. And I think that the sanctions should be, should be, should, uh, be extended to, to those athletes who are not willing to, 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 uh, to condemn these crimes. Though I believe that when Russia 
Russia will be the losing side, many of them will start changing their mind. At this point of your life, is um, come come back to going back to to Russia one of the, your uh, biggest wishes, but different Russia than than it's now. It's not my wish, you know. I think it's inevitable because I I I believe that history, you know, um, uh, has a positive uh, trend. So yeah, it's a bumpy road. We have some very tragic events, but eventually we're moving, you know, to improve you know, the lives of humanity. And I think the, the future of Russia, if Russia has a future, it's, it's with, with Europe, with European democratic values. And, uh, and I think I'm one of those who can help Russia to find its, uh, re reinvent, reinvent herself. So uh, when, when the regime collapses, I, I'm more than happy, actually, I think it's my duty to help my country, though I don't have any political aspirations. I don't want to stay there, run for politics, but there will be a period of transition. The period of moving Russia back to civilized world, and I'm, I will subscribe for that. Actually, you don't see yourself like a politician, but more like a human rights activist. It's the moral human rights activist and somebody who wants to make make a difference. Yes, yeah, going back to my mother lessons. So, and I think that Russia's shifting from non-democratic side to democracy, from tyranny to freedom, could be a decisive factor of the 21st century battle. Uh, against China and other totalitarian states. So that's that's what I think it's my my duty is, and uh, I'm I think I'm you know well positioned because it's it, for me it's a really big picture. It's not just Russia uh, uh, and politics. It's it's a global development because we have so many challenges, and and bringing Russia to the right side could 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 make a great deal of difference. Let's finish this interview with more relaxed topics uh, like. Uh, television series uh, uh, Queen's Gambit is. Uh, did it help to, uh, uh, to the popularity of, of, of chess game? Enormously, enormously. I can tell you, and I said it many times, that when I worked with Scott Frank as the, as the main consultant for the show, nobody expected the show to become that big. And I, uh, I, I, I love the book of uh, Walter Tevis, an American writer. Uh, I, I liked uh, um, the concept that Scott brought together just to actually to have a lot of real chess there. But it's it blew up the wildest expectations. So, and I think it had a tremendous impact on, 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 uh, on propelling chess to the top of public opinion. How realistic were those scenes of and the dynamics of, of the chess chess game in in that in that series? Uh, as you remember, some of the uh, uh, boxing films or some other sports films, there are many unrealistic uh, sports scenes. Uh, if you remember, uh, Rocky Rocky is punching uh, uh, ten yeah, times uh, and yeah. then then yeah. I, I, Ivan Drago pu punching back ten yeah. times. It, it it was not realistic actually. Yeah. No, look, it's absolutely realistic. So I just, you know, it's there's of course a little bit of Hollywood exaggeration, but the idea of chess player looking elsewhere and with pieces flying around, that's that's very much like the mind works. So uh, no, I, I I can guarantee you that is the, the game of chess, the top games and the chess atmosphere, it's as close as one can do in in Hollywood uh, uh, movies. About, uh, 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 and and uh, and uh, uh, re relatively relative to to the real chess competitions. What is your opinion about uh, chess boxing? No, I don't look. I just it's the I, I'm very happy to see people being creative, but you know that's that's a little bit too far to me. Yeah, definitely too far. Yeah. <laughs> So, if you were a younger, would you would you try that kind of sport? Uh, if no, it, if, just, it's, yeah, it, if it was look, invented I, in, in your time, in your best bet years, best years. I know what I can do, but I also know what I cannot do. And I I know it's not speaking about boxing, but about other things. I know the limits of my ignorance and limits of my physical abilities, and I don't want to 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 go beyond that. As a Croatian citizen, uh, one of the most famous at the moment. Uh, what what other uh, sports? Uh, persons, do you like sports? Uh, 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 other athletes, Croatian athletes, do, do you do, do you like? At the yeah, I remember in 2018, you know, I was I was rooting for for our soccer team, for the football team. So they were so close, you know. I, I wish they had a little bit more, you know, energy left for the final match with France. But I think it's, that's I was really proud. I was really proud for them. Actually, I was happy they beat Russia in a, in, in a quarterfinal, and uh, I think it was a phenomenal, phenomenal success. So that's the and I. Again, it's, um, 
I, don't, I doubt very much they can repeat it now at the at, at the at uh, another World Cup. But that was a great moment, moment of glory. How big football player in in your mind is Luka Modric? Look, um, I think he just he definitely was a key player for the team there. So it's the that's why the reason I said Maradona, for instance, uh, 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 versus Pelé, because Pelé was a part of the great team. I think in 1970, the team probably could have won without him. There, some people disagree, but it was a phenomenal team. Without Maradona, Argentina in 1986 was not as great. So Maradona was half of the team. I think Luka Modric was closer to Maradona because without him, without his you know ability to bring team together, they would make it. So I think he was you know a, a big big portion of the team. So that's uh, I I always I always appreciate not only professionalism but also ability to lead, and he was a phenomenal leader. Do you follow any other sports, uh, Croatian uh, national teams, uh, or, or singles, single I, indi- individual I, I, athletes? I'm very, very occasional because I, I have to say that you know my I'm much better you know uh, familiar with the with the World Cups back in in 70s or 80s or 90s in, in football or tennis or basketball. I view right, especially the last six months. My you know I read about frontline news from Ukraine rather than about sport. What do you do recreationally for, for, for you, for yourself? Oh, I do a lot of exercise. So just here now, of course, twice a day I go to my to, to, the, to the beach. So uh, it's, it's, it's here is very easy. <laughs> so this is wow. yeah. wow, I'm trying to, so, um, and, um, and I have an intermediate diet. So I eat twice a day. So miss, miss my breakfast. So I'll start eating at, uh, at uh, 3, 3, 30. By the way, now it's time for me to eat. <laughs> so just, okay. So many good foods, uh, uh, food in Croatia, and you eat only two times a day. Healthy healthy. keyword is healthy, so that's that's important. You know, that's healthy food that makes you makes your body feel better. Mr. Kasparov, thank you very much for your time, and I wish you successful tournament in Zagreb in in second part Uh, of July. So uh, again, it's I I will be open the tournament. I'm more like you know the owner of chairman, but. I'm very happy to see all the best players, including Magnus Carlsen and his challenger, Yanni Pomnish in Zagreb. That's also my duty to actually make sure that, you know, as a Croatian citizen, I bring top chess in Croatia. And let's not forget, I also doing a lot of promotional activities with, through Kaspar Chess Foundation Adriatic. So again, I'm, I'm trying to be a good citizen. Enjoy your stay in Podstrana and Croatia as well, yeah. See you in Zagreb, yes. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank Thanks. You.